Tuesday to all of you. Uh, a couple of things that we'll go over with you uh, today. Uh, the first unit test that you took last week, uh, there are probably still half of you from this period that have yet to uh, finish that, so you want to make sure that you do that. Uh, we'll talk about the end of the grading period, which is this Friday the 18th at 3.15 p.m., and that's a hard uh, close of the grade. So anything that you have not turned in by 3.15 uh, p.m. on Friday will not be graded at all. You will not get credit for uh, during the semester. So you want to make sure that you get those things uh, turned in. Uh, the next unit that we're going to discuss here is basically going to be the Renaissance, the Reformation, and some uh, other items, uh, Glorious Revolution uh, in England, and sort of what the landscape will look like as we move through uh, into the 1700s for you. So we'll go over that as well. Uh, tried to make it a very simple week since it's the end of the grading period. Uh, this one is normally supposed to be six weeks at the beginning, but we took those three extra days uh, to prepare teachers uh, for the 100% distance learning. So this grading period is actually only five weeks of attendance for you. Uh, next grading period will be six weeks and then six weeks. So remember, you generally have three six-week grading periods. The uh, grade at the end of the semester is what goes on your transcript. We have had, uh, from my count, six assignments. Uh, along with the unit test. So each of those assignments have uh, been graded and put into Canvas and Aries. And we'll show you uh, how that'll affect your grade. Your uh, questions on the unit test were 31 point a piece. Uh, so that is roughly gonna be about one third of your uh, six weeks grade. So you wanna make sure that you get that in. Um, go ahead and get to your uh, Canvas um, homepage looks like this, and a couple of things we'll go over, and we'll get started so we can get you out of here. Okay, so a couple of things uh, that we're gonna have for you. Uh, remember last week, just as um, sort of some housekeeping issues, we added this button down here where you can click on and get to your TCI assignments and log in. Um, and then we talked about uh, the new button here on the bottom right. Tutoring is starting uh, today, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have school starting at 3.30. So about 20 minutes after uh, fourth period today, uh, 20 minutes after fourth period tomorrow, and 20 minutes after seventh period um, or the office hours on Thursday, uh, tutoring is available for all of your core classes. So you can get uh, information and help there as long as reach out to me uh, on Mondays. If you go to your modules, this is also something I went over last week, but I wanted to double check because we've already run into some issues even with seniors today. When you finish a module, um, it clears basically your ability to go into the next module. So module one is week one, module two is week two, module three is week three, module four is week four, module five you can see here is week five. The prereqs to get into, all right, the prereqs to get into module five is you have had to have gone through all of the previous modules. You can't just skip around, click on the assignment and finish. It's not gonna let you do that. <clears throat> so I even had a senior today who could not unlock any of their assignments at all. And that's because they had not clicked through one module. We had to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, and so if your assignment says unlocked or unavailable, that's probably why. So remember just to get through a module it's very simple. Just click on the overview page. It'll tell you what you need to do to successfully complete module one, and then you can go on to the next portion, right? Go formative, how we logged in that time, the very first week, then Edmentum, 
right? What you had to do to get through Edmentum. When you're done, right? It'll give you everything that you were supposed to have done. And so when that happens and you've submitted all of that, it will take you to the next module. So week two is module two. So if an assignment is showing that it's locked or unavailable, that is why. Um, so we'll come back to module five and go over that in just a second. The one thing I wanted to um, really stress to you is what you have coming up. So you have um, this assignment, which you should be able to finish in class uh, today. Um, and it's very simple, I'll show you. It's only four questions, very simple. Uh, and then a map identification due next, uh, uh, the 25th is going to be, um, what, a week from Friday, I think, right? The 18th is Friday, so a week from Friday, just to give you enough time to work on everything else. Notice that these are all the past assignments. So everything from the beginning, Canvas and school email, individual login, right? Yeah. Individual assignments, forms of government, no. ancient Greece, uh, religions, homework on TCI and the unit test. These are all still available until Friday, uh, the 18th at 3.15. So even going back to the first week of school, you can see all of those things are available. And it's the same thing if you look yeah. at these going all the way back to the beginning, right? So this one here should be open. I'll make sure that this gets open. Those should have available until the 18th. But I'll put those up and make those available yeah. until uh, Friday. And that's the end of the grading period. After that, they're gone forever. They won't be opened again. Um, and that's set by uh, the school and the basically the grades having to be turned in on time. Any questions on that portion there? Okay, so the um, new units that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the Renaissance, the Reformation, and uh, next week we'll talk about the Glorious Revolution and things that come from that. But basically, um, what we'll talk about today, and as you can see, to get to week five and open all of this up, you have to have gone through your previous ones. So um, this week, in terms of um, the unit, this will be unit two uh, of the semester. In order to successfully complete module five and get to module six next week, you'll have to understand what is meant by the Renaissance, explain the changes in society due to thoughts and movements, um, understand that Europe becomes the center of that particular time period, and then know the countries of Europe as of 1785, which is before, um, and we'll get to this in a couple of units, the French Revolution. So that is what uh, we're going to focus on this week. Remember to move through the module, you need to click on next. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the Black Death, right? such a great thought, right? The plague. So the Black Death um, is a time period in Europe that basically, okay, depending on where you lived, killed from a third to almost two thirds of the population of your particular town. And as it, the bubonic plague travels today, uh, basically uh, it is from uh, fleas, right, uh, biting rodents that have this, and then bite people. They think that this Black Plague uh, in the previous millennium, right, likely originated in Central Asia, and then spread along the Silk Road, which was the trade route from Asia to Europe, and Basically, what it does is for a 200-year period of time, um, puts everybody on a panic level. And so you can sort of see the approximate border, right, and what happens during that time period and where the plague will spread. All right. 
And so if you don't know about the plague and what happens, you can see this now. That makes a lot more sense now, I'm sorry. Let me turn on the closed captioning just in case it skips a little bit, but hopefully you're not, stomach isn't too wheezy from lunch. The delirious victim staggers about in his final moments. His speech is slow, skin purple black, covered with swollen, pus filled lumps as death calls him. Witnesses to this terrifying spectacle called it the dance macabre or dance of death. In the 14th century, a terrible catastrophe fell upon Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa that would change the course of history. The Black Death. The Black Death, or bubonic plague, was an outbreak of disease that killed one third of the European population in the period 1347 to 1350. It had a similarly devastating impact in Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. The disease played no favorites. Rich and poor, young and old, priest and peasant, all fell victim to this horrible and, at the time, unexplained sickness, which was spreading like wildfire. The populations of entire towns and villages were wiped out in a matter of days. The dead were buried in mass graves to cope with the rapid death toll. Only a thin covering of soil was placed over the dead bodies before another layer was buried on top. Pope Clement VI consecrated, made sacred, the Rhone River so corpses could be thrown straight into it. So what is the Black Death? Where did it come from? While it's difficult to trace with any real certainty, the outbreak is believed to have originated in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia early in the 14th century. Prior to this, the disease had existed for centuries in regions of Asia with small outbreaks occurring from time to time. Any one of these could have been the source. <laughs> Once infected, the victim would first experience a high fever, aching limbs and fatigue. Within days, the lymph nodes in the neck, armpits and groin would start to swell and turn black. These black swellings are where the Black Death gets its name. Michael Placentius, first-hand witness to the horrors of the Black Death, wrote, Here, not only the burn blisters appear, but there have developed gland boils on the groin, the thighs, the arms, or on the neck. At first, these were the size of a hazelnut and developed accompanied by violent shivering fits, which soon rendered those attacks so weak that they could not stand up, but were forced to lie in their beds, consumed by violent fever. The boils grew to be the size of a walnut, then to that of a hen's egg or a goose's egg, and they were exceedingly painful and irritated the body, causing the sufferer to vomit blood. The sickness lasted three days, and on the fourth, the latest, the patient succumbed. The stinking pus-filled swelling, otherwise known as buboes, gave the bubonic plague its name. The nervous system under attack, victims would become crazed and delirious with fever. Once the swollen lymph nodes started to burst within the body, the sufferer was not long for this world. Death usually occurred within the week. By the time the infected person who had introduced the disease to the port, town or village died, others would already be in the early stages of infection. This made preventing an epidemic incredibly difficult. The outbreak of the Black Death in the 14th century actually involved three different strains of plague. The most common and visually the most gruesome form is the bubonic plague. The second form was the pneumonic plague. It infects the respiratory system once the bubonic strain reaches the lungs. The third form, septicemic plague, infects the body's circulatory system, that is, the blood. The bubonic plague is actually the weakest of the three strains. 
During the worst outbreaks of the Black Death, pneumonic and septicemic plague had mortality rates of almost 100%. It's believed malnutrition played a major role in making the symptoms more dramatic. Many who died had endured years of famine, the result of severe storms and drought, making their weakened immune system vulnerable. Okay, so what you have happened, right, is basically a 200-year um, period of time in which people didn't understand what was going on but saw that it was a horrible death. And so coming out of that, right, coming out of that time period, basically the middle 1300s uh, through the 1500s, um, there was a refocus on society. There was a refocus on society called the Renaissance, and this time period was called the Renaissance. And basically during this time period, and you can read through the notes if you like here, right? Rediscovery of Greek and Roman writings. Um, they rejected the, the idea that life was only a preparation for the afterlife, especially after going through that sort of time period. Um, prepare men for public service instead of service to the church. Uh, study of earlier writings led to the idea of human achievement and potential, right? And it's basically these ideals that the Greeks and the Romans had talked about that we looked at last unit, right? Uh, Renaissance thinkers and writers talk about political power and the role of government, right? Questioned uh, whether the church teachings and beliefs were uh, right, whether they were just, whether they were equal. You have artists and explorers and merchants and capitalists talk about uh, this time period as well. And so basically, it's a chance to look at um, life in a different way now that they're not worried about the plague. Let me show you a couple of engineering things that are pretty amazing during this time period. After the Dark Ages, Italy lit up the world. And the it emerged from the devastating cloud of the Black Death and brought innovation spectacle. It was an explosion of new ideas from some of the greatest minds of all time. Filippo Brunelleschi was the ingenio, the ingenious man. It produced some of the greatest works of architecture, art, and engineering the world has ever known. The enterprise of Renaissance engineering is recovering this ancient knowledge. I don't think that any other period in the history of Western civilization can brag to having produced so much genius. But achieving such genius was a struggle. As builders battled unprecedented natural disaster, church dogma, and each other. And the Italian peninsula becomes the cockpit, the fighting point. <laughs> This was the age of architects, and it created a bold new sense that nothing was impossible. Four seventy six AD, the great Roman Empire has collapsed ending its period of domination. The emperors who ruled and shaped the region have been dissolved, and Western Europe has become fractured. For centuries, Europe is dominated by a line of German kings who call their domain the Holy Roman Empire. But by the 12th century, a loose collection of Italian republics is taking shape. Together, they aim to recover the past glory of Rome. They would revitalize Europe and engineer the blueprint for the modern Western world. I am Peter. Engineer the blueprint for the modern Western world. I am Peter Weller. And in 2001, I came here to the city of Florence to finish a master's degree in Italian Renaissance art history at Syracuse University in Florence. 
the Italian Renaissance is as overwhelmingly mind-blowing as it is beautiful. It is the most impacting epic of the last millennium. It is the age of invention with Da Vinci and Copernicus and Gutenberg, but it is also the age of the cult of personality. It is the time when that unknown artisan or craftsman will become the artist. It is the time when that nameless builder will become the architect. Okay, so there's one part I want to show you here about what they did. Now, I went to Rome in April of 2019. And uh, basically, there's a little sketch here that I'm going to show you that they talk about, right, what every civilization needs for um, the ability to be productive, and that is water, right? A constant source of water and a constant source of food. Um, and they're going to talk about how that was done here in Rome. And then I'll, I'll finish my thought on being there. They thought that they could find another way to go and search for water. And that way was building uh, some uh, tunnels underground. By digging a network of underground tunnels called Botimi, the workers could tap into small natural springs and groundwater that surrounded Siena. Slowly, the water would seep through the terrain into these narrow tunnels and holding tanks. But excavating these bottini was no easy task. Workers used shovels, picks, and chisels to chip away at the calcite deposits in the tunnel. Working in dark, dusty conditions, often no more than a few feet high. A bottino like this one would sometimes run for miles and miles, so the engineers had to know just where in the heck they were going. So every so often they dug a hole up to the surface, and these holes were called oki or eyes. It would give the engineer a sense of where the direction of the bottino would be, and if they were wrong, they could redirect the bottino. The water would navigate through the barrel-shaped tunnels, turning into different parts of the city where it was needed most, and coursing underneath the busy streets into the fountains around Siena, like the Fonte Gaia. Now these channels had to be pitched at an angle ever so slight, imperceptible to the naked eye, less than one degree, because if the water flowed too steeply, it would overwhelm the system. So to keep this from happening, the engineers used an instrument called an archipendulum. It's nothing but a pendulum. It's a stick with a string and a weighted ball or stone at the end. No matter how much you pitch the stick, the string will always remain vertical, giving you a vertical line in a relationship to the tilt of the horizontal stick. In this way, the water would flow quietly and evenly into Siena and fill up the Fonte Gaia. By the year 1345, more than 10 miles of tunnels were functioning underneath bustling Siena. As a result, Siena continued to grow and prosper. More water brought more people to the boom town. More people to the boom town, more turf is needed. Pretty soon, Siena controls most of southern Tuscany. Now, this prosperity and this land encroachment, if you will, would seriously become the burr in the saddle to one of its neighbors. Florence in Siena. Okay. So, what you have happen, right, makes uh, a good amount of sense. You have the Black Plague, which <clears throat> affects Europe, which has one of the world's largest um, concentrations of population, um, and really, as close as they are in these urban areas, really decimates the population. So, um, at its least, it kills off a third of the population. At its worst, it kills off just over two-thirds of the population and it takes 200 years for it to run its course right where we're looking at this pandemic without a vaccine is going to take probably a year and a half to two years right to run its course and it's already killed um you know 190,000, they say so you can see right coming out of this where people start to feel hope and start to um reflect on things that have done 
And that is what this focus is in terms of the Renaissance. So the Renaissance is sort of this enlightening time after all of these bad years um, of the bubonic plague, which we call the Black Death. The most important invention probably out of this time period is going to be the printing press. The first book to be mass produced by a printing press is the Gutenberg Bible. Gutenberg is somebody who basically figured out how to use removable type. And once you have removable type, you can create different sorts of books rather quickly. And the spreading of ideas during this time period with that um, leads to more and more developments. And you see a number of developments from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, till we get to the Industrial Revolution, the 1800s. So this is a quick overview of what the Gutenberg printing press did and why it was so important. Paper had just been invented in China and come to Europe through Italy. Now the paper was being made for use by the scribes and so it was hard and slick. It didn't work very well with Gutenberg's oil-based ink. And so he had to dampen the paper to soften it up. So he actually printed on slightly dampened paper. And if he just laid a sheet on like that and rolled it under there and did an impression, he could have laid every piece on exactly the same, especially when he prints on the back. He's got to line those columns up exactly. So that's the next big problem he has to solve. What's the answer to that? Well, here it is right here. The tempon and the frisket. So open that up. This is called a tippin. It's just leather over a frame, which provides a place for us to put our paper on. And these little points called duck bills position it up and down. And then they have a mark here for left and right. Now watch this. This, this is very important. These pins poke through the paper. And when he prints on the other side, he puts the paper back on through those same holes. And that gives him exact register from front to back. So those columns are lined up perfectly. Now he has to have something to hold the paper against the tendon. It's called the frisket. We fold it down. It's got out there where we're going to print. And it also allows us to lift that paper back up off that sticky type without tearing it or smearing it. So now we're ready to fold the tendon and frisket down over our inky type. Roll the whole bed of the press underneath the flatten. Flatten is this big flat board that's going to lower to press the paper against the ink type. On the press has the screw device, the flat board, and the handle that turns the screw, and that's going to lower the flat to press the paper against the ink type. The person that did this was called a puller. So we're going to make a small because the bigger the platen is the more power it takes to get sufficient impression and so we've only printed the first page there so we've got to roll it out print the second page now we can roll it out lift the paper off that sticky type and it does make a sound you can hear it come off that sticky type Take our printed sheet off. And then we printed two pages of the Gutenberg Bible. And the genuine copy of the Okay. So three things, right? You have Europe coming out of this 200 year, what they call uh, the Black Death, right? The period where the plague decimates population throughout Europe, throughout Asia, basically anywhere that it had come in contact with. Once the plague ends, people start to re-examine what life is about, right? They look back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. People want to share these ideas of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and that's where Gutenberg comes up with this printing press. So instead of having to hand write 
books can write these ideas. That movable type printing press allows for the dissemination of information, in this case, the Gutenberg Bible, to spread throughout Europe and other parts of the world quickly and elevates, right, sort of the standing of uh, everyone involved. Uh, if you want to watch some specific things about the architecture and the other things that go on, the creation of the domes, you can. Um, but that is basically what the Renaissance is. And so what you uh, do is in your TCI account, under Unit 3, Chapter 13, Section 1, uh, there are some questions about the Renaissance. And so you will fill that out and complete that with the remaining time. So let me show you what that'll look like. So unit three, section 13, or lesson 13, section one. And it'll talk about the Renaissance and what the Renaissance means and what happens through there. You will um, answer the four questions down here at the bottom, right? What does Renaissance mean and why is it used to describe this period? List five reasons why the Renaissance originated in Italy, right? And then complete this statement from the perspective of each people listed below, right? And then how did the ideas of Renaissance transfer um, or transform uh, Europe? And it's basically in this text here. Um, as I said, everything that we have in terms of assignments will be available until September 18th. The only thing that you need to do between now and when we meet next Tuesday, um, and you can wait until Monday, make sure that you get everything that you need for this grading period finished, is going to be the map identifications. There's 16, I think, identifications that you'll need. Um, the easiest way to show that, um, when you click on this, it'll take you to your Go Formative and you can log in, um, is once you are ready to submit, once you're ready to submit all of your answers, copy your right, web address of your submission, take it back to here, go to I'm your sorry. website URL, yeah. and then upload that. And what it'll do is it'll take me to your submission page. Right? It'll take me to your submission page and your stuff will get graded automatically. All right? Anybody have any questions on that?